Whose voice is that? Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Northshire Live. I'm Rachel Person. I'm the event manager for Northshire Bookstore in Saratoga Springs, New York, and joined here as I always am these days by David Wood, event manager for Northshire Bookstore in Manchester, Vermont. A couple of quick notes before we get started. Um, first of all, you may have noticed as you came in that this meeting is being recorded for future broadcasts on our YouTube channel. However, fear not. Um, we have settings arranged so that only those of us who are unmuted and speaking in this lovely yellow box that you see around me will appear in the recording and on YouTube. So you can have your camera on and you will not be immortalized um, on YouTube. Um, so please feel free to keep your camera on if you would like. Um, in light of that, please use the chat box throughout the evening to pose any questions that you have. Um, you can type them in at any point and we will store them up and Davith and I will pose those questions for you when we get to the audience question and answer at the end of the evening. And then last of all, before Davith in introduces our special guest this evening, a note of thanks. Um, it's been a long, hard, weird year for all sorts of independent businesses and in particular for independent bookstores. Um, Northshire has managed to keep its doors open. We've managed to stay, stay here. Um, and that is really thanks to the incredible loyalty and support of our customers. We, we couldn't do events like this one. We couldn't still be here without you. And we are incredibly grateful for that continued support. It means the world to us. And now without further ado, David, please take it away and introduce us. Thanks so much, Rachel. It's my great pleasure to welcome back to Northshire Live, Vanessa R. Sasson for her, new, for her book, Yashodara and the Buddha. We had the good fortune of hosting Vanessa for when she interviewed Wendy, Gar Wendy Garling for her book, The Woman Who Raised the Buddha. Vanessa is professor of religious studies in the liberal and creative arts department of Marianapolis College, Canada. She's also the author and editor of a number of academic books, but she recently tried something new and converted her research into the novel she's presenting tonight, Yashodra and the Buddha. And we are very lucky to be joined tonight for this event by Amanda Deckelbaum. She's a lead project manager and co-host of the podcast Sound Food. Uh, please join me in welcoming to Northshire Bookstore, Amanda Deckelbaum and Vanessa. Hi, everybody. Hi. Thank you for that intro and thank you for having us. This is so nice and I'm so glad to see your faces and that so many of you have your cameras on. Thank you for that. Hi everyone, what a pleasure. I'm so excited to be back and to ask Vanessa a bunch of questions. And yeah, it's beautiful to see all the faces, all the readers. Should we get started? Should we do it? All right, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> okay, cool. So before we begin, I think what would make sense would be to give a brief synopsis of Yashodara's life, the chronology, the basics, and then we can break it down a little bit further. Does that sound good? Sure. Um, I'm wondering if I can break ranks and do something unconventional. Um, since we're a small group, I'm wondering if, if how many of you guys have some knowledge about Buddhism or some sense of the Buddha's life story? Elaine says yes, Angela, yes, Linda. Maybe just Rachel like, just a little bit. <laughs> David says yes. All right. So can I can I just do the teacher move and ask one of you guys to tell me just the skeleton of the Buddha's life story, just out of curiosity? Am I allowed to pull one of you guys? Can I just do that and totally be the awful teacher? Angela, am I allowed to ask you? Um, that he was raised in a um, very wealthy. Um, place and he was did not see suffering and when he got outside the gates he saw so much suffering which Beautiful. was the onset of his journey and he left his wife and child behind to to become to go on this journey teach others oh it's perfect so you knew that he had an, a wife yeah. okay so this is my last question then i'll stop bothering all of you but <laughs> how many of you guys knew that he had a wife i'm just out of curiosity because i come across this all the time daffod you sort of knew well, I hosted you for uh, right, interviews with Lindy your, Garling. That, hey, but I, before that, I had no <laughs> idea. You're totally cheating. <laughs> Linda, did you know or did you not know? You did know. Yes, I did know. How fascinating. The most common thing that I got when I was working on this book was when people say, you're writing a book about the Buddha's wife, the first response is, the Buddha had a wife? And I've gotten this from Western audiences. I've gotten this from Eastern audiences. I've gotten this even in Buddhist contexts. So it's a really interesting thing how much 
she has been sidelined in not just kind of Western popular understandings of Buddhism, but even in traditional contexts, is that she's really not a very central character to most people's understanding. But the crazy thing is that if you look at the literature, you look at the early stories of the Buddha, she's really there. And she's not just kind of a small minute kind of background character, she's a full character and she has really important scenes in the Buddha's biography. And for some reason we keep bypassing her. So is this just women's voices being eliminated or is it something else is a really important question to think about. And it's a question that you can kind of wrestle with as I tell the story. Um, it might be that we're uncomfortable with the idea of the Buddha having a wife, or it could just be age old kind of misogyny. It's you pick. <laughs> so I'll tell you a little bit about the story, but it's a really striking thing that she is so um, kept apart in our imagination. So I want to bring her into your imagination for those of you who've never heard of her. And if you have heard about her, um, I wanna tell you more about her. So as Daphid said, um, I am a professor at a small liberal arts, not a liberal arts college, but a small college in the liberal arts program in Canada. Um, Kennedy who's here in the room is one of the students in the liberal arts program. It's very nice to see her face. I still haven't seen her in real life, but one day I'll see her beyond the little box that I'm used to seeing here. Um, and so my career has been very focused on writing academic books and I'm trained as a scholar. And so I'm trained in doing kind of the traditional way of doing research. Um, you read a lot of books, you learn the early languages and you footnote constantly. This is kind of the process that we get into. And it's a very um, precise process of trying to learn to ask good questions and wait for the right answers and ask next questions over and over and over again. It's a very particular methodology, it's time honored, and it teaches us to be patient with our work. But almost nobody reads it. <laughs> so when you write research, everybody's bored and they fall asleep and the students pretend they read it and then just try to maybe go over the introduction and the conclusion, but nobody likes to read academic writing because it's kind of awful. So it's useful, but it's awful. And so at one point I was uh, reading her story and I wondered, well, what if I wrote it differently? What if I let her come alive in my imagination instead of just studying what the sources say? What if I try to engage those sources by saying it too? And so what I found in those sources was an extraordinary character. And the first thing that really captured my imagination was a tiny little detail that I found in so many texts. I found it in Chinese texts, in Sanskrit texts, in Pali texts, um, Tibetan texts also have it, not in Japanese that I know of, but across the board, there's this tiny little detail that everybody bypasses and that's not very exciting, but to me was the source of the entire book. When the Buddha is born, there's all these miracles, right? And so he's the prince and he's born as a prince in a kingdom. And the day that he, his mother gives birth to him, flowers rain down from the sky and the earth shakes and there's gods pouring, you know, purifying waters like nectar of the gods over the mother and her newborn infant from golden pitchers in the sky. Like it's very beautiful, very magical. And then there's this one miracle that's described that everybody misses. And it says, when he took his final rebirth, when this man who's gonna become the Buddha is finally coming into the world for the last time, because now he's going to be the Buddha and he'll never come back again after this. So in his final rebirth, at the last moment, just as he's coming into the world, seven other beings took rebirth with him. And then the list is given. And the seven beings include the tree under which he achieves awakening, Right? So you know, you've all seen images of him sitting under a tree when he achieves awakening. That tree was seated the moment he came into the world. So they're born at the same time. Um, his most faithful companion, Ananda, who's by his side all of his life, is born at the same time. There's a whole bunch of characters that are really important in his life. And one of those characters is his wife. She takes rebirth at the exact same moment as he does in the same kingdom. So when I look at this, what I was seeing was, okay, all these other characters are really important and they all show that they are important to his story. 
this tells me that she's important to a story too, right? If I put the others aside for a second, because my focus is her, what do I see with my eyes, which was my question throughout the writing of this book, I see something devastatingly romantic. I see this man being reborn in his final rebirth with her right next to him so that they take rebirth together one last time. Then if you go back further, you find out that they had been reborn together lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. That there's all these previous life stories that the Buddhist literature, Buddhist literature um, keeps. Uh, for those of you who know a little bit about Buddhism, they're called jatakas, if this is familiar to you. Jatakas are stories of the Buddha in his past lives. And in so many of those stories, he's married to her. And they go through their lives as husband and wife over and over and over again. So when I think about that, I understand that most people look at Buddhism and they think of monks and renunciation and celibacy. But I'm looking at the stories and I see a man who has been reborn with his partner lifetime after lifetime. And in their final rebirth, they take rebirth together. So the last journey at the last time, which to me is beautifully mm -hmm. romantic, right? We don't have anything quite like that in Western literature. Our romantic stories are very short, right? They're like one lifetime beginning and end and that's it. The only one that I can think parallels, if you know Dante, um, if any of you guys, I'll, I won't tell you the story, but Dante and Beatrice from Dante's um, Parad uh, Paradiso. And anyway, the, it's a long poem from the 13th century, but there we have an afterlife romance that continues in the final chapter where the one that he loves when he was alive, he sees in heaven. But other than that, we don't have multi-life romance stories. And here you have in Buddhism, a multi-life romantic narrative. So I think Buddhists are the most romantic. I haven't really still, Amanda, I'm like lost in my romance. I haven't actually told the story. <laughs> Where should I go from here, Amanda? <laughs> well, I think, I think what I'm trying to lead you toward is- Right, I should get to the story. <laughs> is discussing this methodology that you've come up with, which is hagiographical fiction. And I want to just sort of dive into that, but through the chronology of the way that you wrote this book. So maybe you could just touch on like the basic storyline of what <laughs> happens all the way back. <laughs> what happens to, to her and the Buddha, like the big events, and then discuss what you mean by this hagiographical fiction, okay. which I love that term. Okay. So I have to tell this. Okay, so you see that there's a romantic edge, but I'm going to stop there. So they're <laughs> born together, and he's raised in this fabulous palace. And there is a prediction that is made at his birth that um, one of two possibilities will play out. Either he will be grow up to be a great king, the likes of which no one has ever seen, or he will grow up to be a great religious teacher. And this prediction terrifies his father the king, because the last thing he wants for his son is to become a religious teacher. He wants his son to take up the family business. He wants him to take the throne and be a king and fulfill his responsibilities. And so he does something quite radical, but this is mythology. And this is what I think Angela was making reference to, is that he makes this crazy decision to shut down the palace. And so that the prince can never see old age, suffering, or death. And so he grows up extremely protected in a tiny little bubble and lives this way all his life. One day he discovers his, this Yashodra, the woman who he's taken rebirth with. They find each other again and they have this wonderful moment where they choose each other in a cinder. I'm going back to my romance, but I have to give you this part of the story. This is, I don't know why Buddhist people don't tell this part. So the story is that the ministers are so worried about him because he's not interested in getting married, right? Because he's still philosophical. And so they really need to get him attached to the throne. And so they say, you know what we're going to do? We're going to call all the maidens of the land. That's the Cinderella part. I'm not making this up. This is in the literature. We're going to summon the maidens of the land and you're going to choose one. It's the oldest story in the book. And so they do. And they give him a treasure chest full of gifts of jewels to give to the ladies and all the women arrive and each woman that he meets he gives them a jewel 
right? So just imagine this long line of beautiful women all dressed in their saris and their gold and their painted hands and feet and decorations. And he just gives them a jewel and has no interest otherwise. And the last in line, the last one, because it's Cinderella, comes charging in late and it's Yashodra. And there are different versions of this depending on the text that you read, but he sees her and then she looks at the treasure chest and she realizes it's empty because he's given everything away. And so she says, is there nothing left for me? And he takes the necklace off from his own neck and he gives it to her and declares her his chosen bride. Now there are other versions of it where she does it to him, which I like even better, where she takes his hand, pulls his ring off his finger and puts it on her hand. There's even another version that says, and this is getting us to the sources and to the hagiographies that Amanda was pointing to, that when he gives her the gift, she looks at him and I imagine such an audacious look on her face and says, is that it? <laughs> so we have a fabulous character here, a woman who's running in late and then is not pleased with the gift even though she's been chosen by Prince Charming, right? So she's definitely got personality, she's got character and they have a real relationship of some kind. They get married and then they spend years together living in this closed in palace. But then one day the prince gets antsy and he thinks, I need to know what's outside this bubble. Kind of like a post COVID moment of breaking out of the prison. Um, and so he escapes and he goes out of the palace um, and he sees those things that his father was trying to shield him from. And so very specifically, he sees old age, sickness and death. And according to many of the stories, these are visions that are delivered by the gods to make sure he sees them because it's time for him to get on his way. And so these images are brought to him and he sees old age, sickness and death and he is devastated, right? A, quite, I mean, there's a lot of COVID parallels here in, in my imagination of just, we've heard about these kinds of stories and we know that these things can happen like a pandemic but we don't really think they're gonna happen to us. And then our world gets catapulted because we see it and we live it and our world changes. And so this is what's happening to him is that he may have theoretically known about old age, sickness and death, but now it's right in front of him and it's real. And he is shaken to the core because it's not abstract. I think so often of how many times I'd read about the 1918 pandemic and never thought twice about it. Right now, anyone will ever say the word to me and it will be different, obviously, for all of us. So he sees the three and then he sees one more. And the fourth one is, Angela, do you remember this? I do not right now. The fourth <laughs> one, the, it's a terrible student. Um, <laughs> the fourth one is renunciation. He sees a monk. And when he sees the monk who looks so free and calm, he thinks to himself, that's what I want. I want to be free. And so what he saw with old age, suffering and death was the inevitability of what would happen to us. This is suffering. And then he saw freedom from suffering, all of which is orchestrated by the gods. And he knows now there's no turning back. He needs to have that. And so he goes back to the palace. And according to some accounts, the night that he goes out to see these four sites is the night that she is giving birth to their first and their only child. And so she's giving birth, she's in the throes of labor, which is suffering and eventual aging, certainly ages your body, um, and risking death. And so she's in suffering and he's contemplating it. And so you again see that there's a kind of partnership here that they're experiencing really profound changes at the same time, but very differently. That she, and, and in some ways quite gender interesting parallels that he's kind of having this philosophically abstract engagement with suffering, but that it has shaken him. And she's in the suffering, she's in the blood and the mess. She's in the dirt of human life. 
And so they're both completely there. And he decides I can't stay. But now comes the next line that shook my interpretation of the Buddha is that he comes back from the four sites and he, see, he hears that she's given birth and she's lying in her bed asleep with her newborn son in her arms. And he goes to her room, according to one text, a Pali text, he goes to her room and he stands at the threshold and he looks at her and he doesn't step into the room. He won't, he can't cross the threshold. So it's this really, it's almost like an invisible power line or something, right? He just stands at the door and then he thinks, and this is the line that really captured my imagination. He thinks to himself, if I touch my son, which he obviously wants to do, his son is born, right? He's a father for the first time, the emotions, the power of this moment. And yet he thinks, if I touch my son, she will wake up and I won't be able to leave. And so he turns around and he walks away and he leaves the palace and he goes on his great stallion of a horse, the famous white Kantaka, this beautiful big white stallion that is so powerful it could jump three kingdoms in one night without even breaking a sweat. He jumps on Kantaka, this beautiful horse, and goes charging through the palace compound and the gates open magically because the gods are cheering him on because he has to do this. He has to find the answer to suffering. It is his time and they are pushing him towards it. And so he escapes through the palace. He goes right through the, and as he's approaching the gate, Kantaka the horse thinks to himself, if that gate doesn't open, I am just gonna fly right over it. And so he's preparing himself to pounce and then the gods push the door open and out they go. And they charge across the kingdom. And then the text tells us he could have done three kingdoms in one night, but the gods were so excited by this moment that they were raining flowers over them and the flowers became so thick that Kantaka was having a hard time moving through the flowers and he only made it through one kingdom's breadth. But he gets him all the way across to the other edge of the kingdom where his father's power cannot pull him back. And then he gets off his horse and he walks away. And Yashodara is sleeping. And to me, this is, it's an amazing story. It's, it's a timeless story. It's a story of desire and of love and of attachment and of loss and of wanting two things that conflict, which we must all know at some points in our lives where our lives contradict and it's which path do I go? And the answer is you don't get both. You get one path or you get the other, but you don't get both. And he made his choice and she didn't make any choices. And that also is a woman's experience. And so the next morning she wakes up and this is her big moment in the drama is that she wakes up and she discovers that he's gone. And different poets tell the story differently, but so many of them, even though they wanna follow the Buddha. And so the whole point of Buddhist literature is to tell the story of him. What is so intriguing to me is that so many of the early writers stop the story of the Buddha and like they, they turn their lens on her. They're gonna go back to him in the forest, but for one moment, one scene, one chapter, they sit with her and they pay attention to her reaction and her expression of loss and they do it exquisitely. They express her loss and so many of these early poets were men and yet here they are inhabiting a woman's experience and expressing a woman's sense of loss as though it's them. And the poetry is superb. It is some of the best material of early Buddhist storytelling is these scenes in her voice. And so in some of them, she is railing. She is furious. She goes to the, the stables and she finds the chariot driver and she pulls him aside and she wags her finger in his face and she says, how dare you take him away from me? Tell me where he went. And he says, I don't know. And then she says, how could you let him go? Didn't you tell him about me? I'm here. How could you let him go without telling him about me? This is no wallflower. 
this is a woman from 2000 years ago in people's imagination, historically, neither here nor there. But in the writing, these are male authors giving a female such a strong voice and a will to just rise up with all the ferocity of a woman that can be. And she says, you did wrong by me. He's supposed to stay. And that is her story. So then we go and we follow the Buddha and he has his adventures and he becomes super famous. And then um, years later, once he's achieved awakening, he comes back and he comes back the hero to pay respects to his father. And everyone in the palace is so excited. He's come back, the prince has returned and they all go running into the courtyard to see him with one exception, according to the Tibetan accounts. In the Tibetan versions of the story, she looks at through the window, she sees him being worshiped by everyone. And she thinks, nope. <laughs> if he wants to talk to me, he's gonna have to come find me himself. <laughs> And she turns around and she goes back into her room and she closes the door and she knows her husband because he does. Because he knows he owes her that. And so even though everyone goes to see him in the courtyard, he gets up to go find her. And he knocks on her door and she lets him into her room where they have a conversation. And that conversation is almost never described in the literature which is devastating. So I made it up. So I put it in the book, but I had to make it up because I'm, I'm sorry, this conversation had to have happened. Um, but he does go to see her almost like the husband he was, right? He goes into her personal space, which a man does not do to a woman who's not his wife. And so it's almost as though that relationship pulls them back together. And so there is some kind of a conversation, but then he does something even worse. He tells her that their son is now seven or eight years old and it's time to bring him to the forest to join him to learn the tradition. Carol, your facial expressions are amazing. <laughs> I'm loving your facial expressions. So he takes her son away after everything she goes through. He then leaves with the son and she is left alone in the palace. And so her story is one of layers and layers of loss and it's very moving and very feminine and historically and currently familiar um, and in so many ways true and that's the story that I wanted to write that I did write okay now I'm done I'm gonna stop now now you talk <laughs> and Thank you guys you. can interrupt with questions I'm so okay with that it's the summer do whatever you'd like so just <laughs> I don't, I'm breaking rank. Rachel and David might kill me because I'm not doing things the way I'm supposed to, but whatever you'd like. Mm, I have a, I have a question. Okay. So uh, just, I hear a lot in what you're saying, this, this um, issue of voice. And I, when I was reading the book, you know, obviously this, this um, question of voice in, Yashodara's experience comes through your writing her perspective, but you also touch a little bit on the position that you're you put yourself in of writing this story. Um, you specifically write, <laughs> if I was the one to write it, what would I say? Was I even allowed to try? And I'm curious to know where that question came from in your experience as a female writer and then how you, or maybe you just didn't and I'm connecting the dots here, how you related that question to Yashodara's story. Um, it's a really important question. Um, I, so I've spent 20 years reading these ancient texts and studying them and learning to be very sensitive to voice and to power dynamics and being aware of colonialist histories. Um, so this is something that I'm trained in and that I've spent a lot of time with. And so, so much of being a scholar is about having 
your material, your object of study, your text, whatever it is, and standing outside of it and trying to observe in as fair a way as you can with some capacity for sympathetic observation, but also critical, but to stand outside and treat whatever it is you're studying as something that is outside of yourself. And there's a technique to this and there's a practice to it and a methodology. And this is what we do as scholars is we try to look at the world and try to express what is it that we see the world is doing in this particular instance. Mm -hmm. And we try as best as we can to be as objective as we can. And we study as detailed as commas and you know, spelling from one text to another to bigger questions. But what eventually dawned on me was that I felt like, and this is the example I often give, is um, I felt like a dance critic that never danced. And it was starting to make me nuts, is that I was trying so hard to stand outside and I thought, it's like being a, 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 on a cooking show, but you don't taste the food or something like that. There was something really wrong in what I felt like I was doing. And it's odd because Buddhist scholars will go to Buddhist communities, will meditate in temples, will participate in ritual. Like we go, like I, whenever I go to the, anywhere in the Buddhist world, I'm participating um, and I'm engaged with the communities that I'm working with, studying with. I, I don't, hold back, right? If there's a ritual going and someone invites me to sit, I sit and I enjoy and I'll bow. So there's a space there for the scholar to be inside, but we also keep the mental space of being outside. And so we're playing that in our heads all the time. But when it comes to writing, we don't. And so I study the text, but I don't try to write one. And what I suddenly wondered was, but what if I did write one? And that was, am I allowed to? And so I thought, okay, how, how do I answer that question? And the way I answered the question was, well, when I look, if you look at my books everywhere here, there are so many Buddhist texts. There are so many versions of the Buddha's life story. With one of the questions I get all the time in class is, what's the what's the book <laughs> right which right like which what where's the buddhist bible right which one do i have to read so i understand buddhism and it's infuriating to so many westerners because buddhists don't have a bible they have a thousand they have ten thousand right they have library fulls of books and so it's hard to navigate it, it's certainly intellectually more challenging than just here's a bible and you know work with that it's it's vast but the fact that there's thousands and thousands of texts means that there's thousands and thousands of writers. And there are texts from China and Tibet and Malaysia and India and Nepal and Sri Lanka and Korea and Japan and Taiwan. I mean, you name it, they're there. And so wherever Buddhism goes, new writers try to engage with the literature and think, okay, how would I say it? And so from there I thought, oh, I think, I, it's not even just that I'm allowed. I think the tradition is built in such a way that it invites us to try mm -hmm. it again. How would you tell the story? If you were to read the text, what, like, what would you see, right? And the amazing thing is that if we don't allow ourselves to tell the story again in our own voice, we kill the tradition. It ends. The tradition lives because people are telling the story. And each time the story gets told, it takes on new life and it's different, right? Every grandmother that tells the story of the Buddha's life to their grandchildren, she tells it in her own way. So this is what keeps a tradition alive is when we tell stories. The way you kill a tradition is you say, there's only one way to tell it. There's only one storyteller and you must do it this way. Mm -hmm. That's how you kill a tradition. How you keep it alive is that you invite the community to make it their own. So with all of those kind of questions and realities, I thought, no, I have to try to write this now. What will happen when I write it? What will I see? And what do I see? I see romance to no end, which surprises so many scholars over and over and over again, because we haven't been looking for that. What we look for as academics, we tend to look for the renunciation. That's what we're focused on the philosophy, on the non-attachment, right? That's what has impressed us for so many years. But when I let go, I saw Julia Roberts' movie. 
<laughs> I, I really did. I was like, why are we not looking at it like this? I don't understand. <laughs> Which means, and I might, it doesn't mean that I'm right, but it doesn't mean I'm wrong, right? It means here's one more way to read it. Mm -hmm. And in case you want to jump on me, just so you know, the academic in me, of course, has a caveat. And I have 30 pages of endnotes at the end to justify every academic argument I made. So as you read each chapter, I'm like, the reason I did this is because this text does that. And so I collected everything and I backed it all up and then I let myself go. Mm -hmm. And that's how you keep a tradition alive. Hmm. On the note of collecting, collecting stories and bits and pieces, you mentioned how her perspective and, and narrative was pretty scant throughout, throughout the recording of these, um, can we call them histories, histories, stories? I don't know. History. We don't know what the history is. Okay. And I'm wondering from, from your perspective, why? Why do you think this is? Why do you think her, her narrative has been sideswept? Amanda, I'm gonna do the annoying teacher thing again. Why do you think it's been sideswept? <laughs> okay, so I have two, two potential <laughs> answers. Okay. <laughs> One is, because it's the story of the Buddha. There. <laughs> um, and, and so we need to focus on that. And then the other side is because, well, I think it sort of sweeps into because it's the story of the Buddha. So she's a, she's a woman having a pretty visceral experience of suffering and I think that this narrative would, I don't know if the word demonize is a little bit too harsh, but definitely put into question the, um, the purity of Buddha. And I think that- That's a good answer. Mm, and I think that interestingly, reading your book, this polarity of experience, like you just pointed out, um, in the birthing example, where he's contemplating suffering and she's pushing a human being out of her body. <laughs> um, this polarity made my relationship to the story of the Buddha um, much richer. And I think one of the things that is a shame is that these stories are left out because I think that the multifaceted nature of them is what makes them so so rich and I don't think that it discounts the experience of the individual characters or individuals you know I don't know that's my answer that's my hypothesis I think that's a perfect answer and I couldn't have done it better I think you're right I mm -hmm. think we were afraid probably I think you're right that there's probably a protection of the Buddha like I just did an interview um, yesterday in Malaysia and one of the questions is a very strong Buddhist community out there um, and despite it being a Muslim country it's a really interesting context but one of the questions was you know his leaving her caused her so much suffering but maybe that was just a different context and maybe it didn't really cause her suffering like like it was like maybe historically it seems to us that he caused her suffering, but really in those days it would have been fine. Mm. And I thought, nope, no, no, I think it was awful then. <laughs> 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 because the literature tells me that she's devastated and she's railing and she's crying and she's upset, right? That the literature is emphasizing her suffering. I'm not, right? That mm. was my cue I took from the early sources. So I think the tradition had the courage. I think these early poets and writers had the courage to say renunciation is really complicated and this story is complicated so that we want to praise him, but we also want to be mad at him. And, and we also have to understand that renunciation has a cost, that every decision has a cost, mm -hmm. right? That until she's going to be free of her emotions of this, his leaving is a disaster. Mm. And the tradition holds that. 
we're being simplistic about it and saying, no, no, everybody was happy. Or, you know, he had a wife, but we don't have to pay attention. No, you have to pay attention that he had a wife and he had a son and he had a father and he had a kingdom of citizens who depended on him and he left all of them. The horse dies of a, this is the worst part of the story is that after he drops him off at the edge of the forest, the horse says, I, like, I wanna come with you. And the prince says, no, you have to stay back. You have to go back to the palace. And the horse collapses and dies of heartbreak. So there's such a sense that everyone feels the loss of him. And the tradition is not sugarcoating it, right? And I think that's its depth. I think that's the richness of the tradition. That's what you're saying, right? It's that by giving us that complexity, we are invited into a more real, more human conversation than just, he's the Buddha and he's, I don't, I, like, I don't know what that is. This kind of like, you know, one-sided narrative with no depth to it. Right. But what I can understand as a human being is that if the Buddha were my son and he left, I'd be sobbing. He's not supposed to go. His stepmother cries so much, according to one text, that her eyes cut covered with scales and she can no longer see. And she's one of the great heroes of the tradition. Her story is magnificent. That's the next book I'm writing. Right. And so she's a really powerful character. And yet she's so heartbroken. Her eyes are covered with scales. So I think we have to honor that the tradition makes it complicated for us. And we have to stop telling this like uniform narrative that it's only about him. It's him in a world of people who loved him, who were affected by his behavior because that's real life. It's such a better story too. <laughs> It is a good story. Right? <laughs> <laughs> this doesn't work for 2,000 years if your only story is some floating character that's at peace with everything all the time. I mean, yeah. how boring can you get? Very sanitized. Uh, I mean, so sacrilegious. You're going to put this online. <laughs> it's going to be public. And I'm saying sacrilegious things. <laughs> okay. So I have I have one more question before we open up the, the questions to the audience. I see that someone already asked a, a great question. Um, who did you write this book for? For her. <laughs> and for me, nobody else really. I didn't even think it would ever get published. I thought it was a crazy thing to write a novel. And it was like dancing in private in your bedroom kind of thing, you know? <laughs> like, okay, I'm a dance critic, so I'll pretend I'm Barishnikov in my bedroom. Um, and then it kind of took on a momentum and I couldn't stop it, so. But it was really for me to get to know her and for me to write it because I needed to write it. I desperately needed to write this book. What was that desperation from stemming from? Oh, who knows? Midlife crisis? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know, but I know I needed to write this book. It was just not going back in. It had to come out. So that's that. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Myla. Linda, Linda asked a question. She's saying, thank you for illuminating this part of the Buddha and Yashodara's life. Does she follow him and become a student, reach realization like his mother did? That's such an important question. And I had to get to that. So I'm glad you got me there. Um, that's what the next book is about. Uh, she does. So she's left behind in the palace. Um, and one day, the stepmother, the Gotami, who's this formidable character for the Buddhists, especially for women, she's the one who eventually makes the decision uh, to follow her son into the forest. Uh, and her thought is, if the men can be monks, why can't the women? And so she leaves the palace. And the literature says that she leaves with 500 other ladies. And so they don't tell us who the ladies were right away, but she leaves, she walks out of the palace. So she has her own kind of great moment of renunciation where she walks out and countless women follow in her footsteps. And the legends are that Yashodara was part of it, um, but she fades as a character so that we don't follow her as a nun. She does become a nun. There's one text that tells us that she becomes a great teacher and an important nun in the assembly, but most of the texts don't tell us how she lived as a nun. Um, they're very quiet about her. And I think it's because my theory is it's too destabilizing to have the wife there. 
Because now mm -hmm. that you're a community of renunciants, the wife is kind of a awkward character to have. It's much safer to have the mom. It's a little bit like a Christianity move. It's safer to have the mom than Mary Magdalene. So let's just do that. Um, I think that's a little bit, I think it's the same strategy. Uh, so she gets put to the side, but the tradition um, does have it that she eventually learns to let go and she's freed of suffering. And so the next book that I'm in the process of finishing right now is the story of the women leaving and going to ask for their seat at the table. And that's a whole other story. It doesn't go well. <laughs> a disaster. <laughs> it's, yeah, I, it's, I've, I've chosen some really, <laughs> it's a bit of a disaster, but. <laughs> Um, Linda wants to know if his son also becomes a follower. Um, <laughs> so you're saying, Linda, when I'm looking at Linda, hi, Linda. <laughs> um, is that your question about her, her, his son? So his son, I probably needed a lot of therapy because his son, his son, um, the Buddha names him before he leaves. When he sees his wife and the son sleeping, he thinks his name. And the name he gives him is Rahula. And Rahula, it's negotiable what it means, but most common interpretation is it's either an eclipse or more likely it means obstacle. It's therapy. Um, <laughs> so he looks and the most common interpretation is that he looks at his son and he thinks this is my obstacle to enlightenment, right? It's the attachment to my child. And so he doesn't even touch his child. Um, but he does take his son with him to the forest and he becomes the youngest monk in the history of the tradition. And so that becomes the age um, limit for monks is Rahula's age because he was allowed in. So the youngest you're generally allowed is seven or eight, but nobody follows that rule. Um, and he is said to become awakened also in an important teacher. But interestingly, just like Yashodra, we hear very little from him. He's such a minor character afterwards. So it's like the people that were closest to him that really reflect his family life are kind of rendered invisible in this part of their life story. Mm -hmm. It's like we don't want to have too many reminders of his son or his wife. So we pay attention to cousins and to aunts and uncles, but not a son or a wife. Mm -hmm. Lorraine wants to know how old he was when he left the palace. Well, all the texts are different and the early Buddhists were terrible about that. Like they just, they make up numbers left, right and center. So no, I don't know what to believe half the time. It's a little bit like biblical numbers. It's just, you're scratching your head going, really? 900 years old, really? Um, so different texts tell us different numbers, but the most common number that people kind of state with regards to his age is that he was 35. Um, so it's definitely his own midlife crisis. Um, that he was married, according to some texts, when he was 16 to Yashoda. No, 35 is when he achieves awakening. 29 is the most common number for when he uh, leaves the palace. So, but I wouldn't, I don't know that people were counting their ages in those days. I don't know how serious these kind of numbers should be taken. Every text you read gives you a different number. Um, it's not the kind of thing. We're very strict about birth dates and ages and time periods because we clock everything today. I don't know that historically that was ever the case. So they're kind of roundabout numbers. They become symbolic numbers, but some point in middle age, but certainly before he's an old man. Thank you. I think Unless we have any other questions, I have one that we can close out with, um, okay. Vanessa. Yeah. Uh, and that's, can you, what are some uh, really, well, actually, here's one from Bill. Never mind. Let's leave my question. Alone. Bill said, <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm you, curious about your question, but Bill just asked an awesome question. I yeah, just thought very, what, Bill, can you tell me, where's Bill? I don't see, oh, there's Bill. I see a black screen. Um, Bill, do you, are you okay to speak up or should we just read your question? Oh, by answering that, you have to speak up. <laughs> okay, Amanda, do you want to read the question to me? Because I just sure. Yeah, so Bill is asking, do you encounter any negativity from purists like Dan Brown had to deal with the Da Vinci Code? Okay, so it's partly a great question and partly you just stabbed me in the heart because you compared me to the Da Vinci Code. Um, <laughs> 
So I appreciate the nature of your question, but I'm a little bit devastated. Um, the Da Vinci Code is not written by a scholar. It's written as a thriller. There's really very little background research done on it. There is some to it that's kind of, you know, there you could have some fun with Mary Magdalene, but um, I would not want to be put in the same camp as him. That being said, uh, I did worry for a long time. Uh, fundamentalism is real and it is galloping forward uh, all over the world, uh, India and Sri Lanka, no less. Um, than other parts of the world. We don't tend to think of Buddhism as becoming a fundamentalist country, a, a fundamentalist religion, but it, it is certainly happening. And there are all kinds of reasons. Every context is different. But at the end of the day, there are purists that are getting stronger and stronger. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is definitely one of my concerns. And that was one of the reasons why I put so many notes at the end of the book uh, to kind of protect that conversation a little bit and say, before you jump, here's the background research. Here's why each step of the way I did what I did. So I've given the readers a map precisely in the hopes of kind of staving off too much critique that um, because most people, even certainly fundamentalists, don't know the text necessarily quite the way an academic is going to know them. And so I'm going to put scenes and material in here that is going to catch people off guard. Um, and then I'm using texts from all over the tradition. So for example, um, there's a Tibetan tradition that after the Buddha left, Yashodra was almost raped by her cousin because he was trying to get her for himself so he could take the throne. So if he could capture her, he could be the king in his cousin's place. It's a devastating scene. It's only in the Tibetan accounts. I knew that if I put that scene in here, and I thought it was a very smart scene, it makes sense culturally and historically, that those people who don't have that text, most notably in Sri Lanka, would be devastated, shocked, horrified. How could I have her, you know, almost raped by a man? Um, but I think this Tibetan account actually makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. So I put it in the book um, because I think a woman left alone without a husband who represents the throne must have been a target. Mm -hmm. And I think the Tibetans were smart in recognizing that. Mm -hmm. But the end notes are there precisely to say, before you jump at this scene, know that it actually comes from the literature. Mm -hmm. So far, um, the response has been really oddly positive. Um, I haven't, yeah, I feel like I have to bite my tongue after this. So far, nobody, you know, is threatening me in any terrible way. But I hopefully have presented this with a lot of enthusiasm and love that it doesn't kind of come across as too aggressive. Um, anything's possible coming in the future, but I've tried very hard to be respectful uh, and back myself up. But I will tell you that one editor early on, not, not of this edition, but an early, earlier person wanted me to put a sex scene in uh, between Yashoda and the Buddha because they thought it would sell better. <laughs> I did not. <laughs> I was like, no, that's dumb and that's not gonna happen. So I try very hard to also be very respectful of our imaginations of these characters and not take us to places that we don't need to be going. <laughs> because they're sacred people to so many people and I was very conscious of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Vanessa, thank you. Uh, and Amanda, thank you both so much. This has been a really wonderful uh, event. Uh, sorry you're not going to win the, the best uh, or the uh, worst uh, uh, sex and fiction award every year. <laughs> um, so, but, you know, that's okay. It, it would be very awkward seeing you. <laughs> thank you all so much for joining us tonight. This has been a lovely evening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Amanda. Thanks, Thanks Vanessa. Thanks, Thanks, Rachel and Duffy. Bye, guys. Thank, Thank you. you, everybody. This Thank has been you, really Vanessa. wonderful. Thank you, Candace. David, I want to know what your question was. Oh, it was going to be uh, really noteworthy things about writing uh, fiction instead of academic criticism and scholarship. What are some like major differences? But we, yeah, we, don't, we don't have time for this. <laughs> Take care. Thank you so much, everybody. Good night. Bye. Good night. Thank you. Bye.